Hi, it's me, Katie. And me, Adrienne. And you're listening to Kindled. A podcast where we dig into the science behind building relationships and environments that help kids unlock their full potential and become empowered learners. Together, we'll discover evidence-based tools and methods that will empower you to kindle the curiosity, motivation, and well-being of the young people in your life. Welcome to another episode of Kindled. Katie, it's so nice to see you today. How's it going? It's going great. Kind of great. I'm a little stressed about some kid things, but that's like pretty normal. Very normal. What's going on? Yeah. So the latest thing I'm kind of thinking about is handwriting. My boys struggle with handwriting. I honestly think one of them might have like borderline dyslexia, not dyslexia, but dysgraphia. And so I'm trying to figure that out. And I'm learning a lot about that, but I don't know if the, we'll call it less than great handwriting is because I haven't pushed them hard enough or been mm. like rigorous enough in their instruction and like making sure they're practicing and writing a bunch, or if there's an actual like internal struggle here. And so I don't know how hard to push it. And when I do try to push it, get a lot of counter will and a lot of attitude and a lot of defensiveness. And so I'm like, this has never been the culture of learn around learning that we've had in our house. So I'm, it feels different and startling to me. Yeah. Why do you think you're feeling that way? I honestly, this is what it is. I think that a lot of people use handwriting as a indicator of intelligence where it's like, Oh, if that kid has good handwriting, that's a smart kid. And these like labels kind of get put on kids. And I have made different educational choices as a parent than most. And I'm super happy with the results of those decisions in 99% of the ways, but the handwriting is like the 1% of it. And I'm like, maybe I should have done something different here, Um, but maybe not. Maybe we're just in the middle of a handwriting battle and we're going to get to the top of it and we'll have learned good things about learning and ourselves as humans. And that'll be worth the fight. (laughs) Now, is it the actual physical like writing of the handwriting or being able to formulate a sentence? The actual formation of the letters is hard. I think that like higher levels of stress that I'm having right now are really tied to him being judged and then me being judged. So I'm kind of just feeling a little maybe defensive or like fragile around this. And so I'm just kind of navigating that this week and I'm excited for our conversation today because I think we maybe are going to get into some of, to some of those deeper questions of how hard do we push our kids and when is an appropriate time to really demand the rigor and force, or is it usually better to kind of go with the flow more? Yeah, I'm totally looking forward to it as well because I have a kiddo who does not like to write. His handwriting looks great when he does write, but he (laughs) will not write. So that is our problem. And we, well, maybe it's not a problem. I don't know. We'll find out. So our (laughs) guest today, her name is Gina Riley, and she is an educational psychologist, clinical professor, and the program director of the Adolescent Special Education Program at CUNY Hunter College. Dr. Riley has over 25 years experience in online, hybrid, and high-flex teaching and learning at the college and university level. She is known internationally for her work within the fields of homeschooling, unschooling, and intrinsically motivated self-directed learning. She's currently the president-elect of the New York State Association of Teacher Educators and a faculty advisor for Supportive Decision Making New York. SDMNY.org, which is an alternative to legal guardianship for individuals with disabilities. Her books include Unschooling, Exploring Learning Beyond the Classroom, and The Homeschooling Starter Guide, and The Joys of Self-Determined Learning, which I have not read her books yet, but I cannot wait to dive into them because I personally am starting to make this shift into more of the self-directed unschooling world for one of my children. So I, I have a more personal reason why I'm excited to hear Dr. Riley today. 
Awesome. Let's get into it. Dr. Gina Riley, welcome to Kindled. We're so excited to chat with you today. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. So the first thing I'd love for you to share with us and our listeners is just help us understand your story. Where are you coming from? Um, why do you engage so passionately in the work of education and all of the things that you do in your life? Sure. So um, my story begins in the late 90s. I was a young single mom and I had my baby at 20 and I was in undergrad and studying psychology and like began to get really interested about like the topic of motivation. And it wasn't until my master's where I really started to dive deep into intrinsic motivation. I am not an extrinsically motivated person, right? Like I love what gets me up is like the joy and the curiosity and like all the wonderful things the day brings. And I sort of wanted like my child to have that exact same experience, and so I began to research deeply into the field of intrinsic motivation. Um, I learned a lot during that time about uh, Edward D.C. and Richard Ryan and self-determination theory. Yeah. I remember, yeah, I remember reading an article about them in the New York Times in like the year 2000 and then just being like, this is it, right? Like, this is exactly like how I want to live my life. This is exactly how I would love to facilitate my child, like the, the means to live this life. Um, and so I dove really deep into the concept of intrinsic motivation. Um, at the time, I was also thinking about education, not only from an intellectual perspective, but also from a personal perspective. Where was I going to send my child to school? How was this child going to be educated? Um, and so I began to just sort of research things and had gotten connected to the homeschooling community and decided to really research it for right like research it first and so my master's thesis was on intrinsic motivation in homeschoolers in 1999 um wow. and it was a qualitative study it took like three years to do I'm so happy I did it I just actually found it it was like written on a typewriter right I was like so excited um ended up um homeschooling my own child, just like for the first year, kindergarten's not mandatory in New York state, no big deal. Mm -hmm. um, we're just going to play, you know, for that year. And we didn't stop. So every year he kind of got the choice. Do you want to, do you want to go on with this? Do you want to do something else? Do you want to explore schools? And every year he chose to homeschool. And at the time we were probably engaging in the philosophy of unschooling. Mm -hmm. um, and so that also really was very interesting to me especially the tie between intrinsic motivation and homeschooling and unschooling. Yeah, and so really. that has been the focus of my research ever since. I kind of feel like I can resonate with that as well. Cause once I learned this, I was like, Oh my gosh, why are we all living like this? Why are we, yeah. we being forced what to do all day long? Yeah. It's, I mean, it's really exciting. And then, um, but what you also have to know about me is my other side, right? For, for 15 years, I have um, taught teachers uh, public school teachers in the New York City DOE. And so like I research unschooling and homeschooling and I am a uh, program director of the adolescent special education program at Hunter College. And I literally teach New York City school teachers all day. So I have that really nice balance of like, you know, teaching teachers. And I, and I really talk about intrinsic motivation. I don't talk about homeschooling or unschooling because it doesn't serve them. And then having the research lens of um, researching intrinsic motivation and self-determination and homeschooling and unschooling and all that. I can imagine how intrinsic motivation could really serve the teachers <laughs> and help them uh, be better at their jobs too, uh, whenever you're letting kids, you know, dive into what they want. Well, could you take us a little more into what self-determination theory is, like what the three needs are, an overview of it? Sure. So self-determination theory, again, D.T. and Ryan, 1985, is what really defines intrinsic motivation, right? And so when you're talking about intrinsic motivation, you're talking about joy and passion and curiosity and doing what you love. And then I got really interested into the sub theory called cognitive evaluation theory. Ooh. So fancy name, right? <laughs> and really, really simple. So what cognitive evaluation theory is, 
is it sets up the environmental tenets that facilitate, not force, right, because that would be extrinsic, but that facilitate intrinsic motivation in others. Teachers use this, the medical field uses this, industrial psychology uses it, right? It's used in all sorts of different areas. Um, but those three things that facilitate an environment of intrinsic motivation are a sense of competence, a sense of knowing your strengths, a sense of um, really being able to identify what you're good at, a sense of autonomy or a sense of freedom and choice, and then a sense of relatedness, which is having one person who really, um, who you feel believes and trusts in you no matter what. So when we're talking about facilitating a sense of competence, it's all about really identifying students or your own children's strengths, right? What are they competent at? What do they feel in their heart that they're good at? We can identify this, you know, in, in schools by measurements and surveys and things like that, or just by talking to kids. But, you know, we can also identify it by just like conversation. What do you love? What are you good at? What do you feel um, that you can give to this world? You could see it by watching kids, right? Some kids are like really big in Minecraft and really big at Legos and like that's what they love and that's what they're good at. And so just really having this open um, conversation about kids' competence, I think that's really important no matter what, right? And so not having judgment over that competence, right? If it's, if it's golf, if it's bowling, that's a competence, right? I know like video games, that's a competence. And so um, just really taking that in um, and really identifying it. So can we dig in there a little bit? So in school, I mean, you have to help kids deal with incompetence, right? It's like the whole idea, and maybe you can disagree with that, but the ideas that like you're here to learn, which kind of presupposes that you don't know something or can't do something and that you'd like to acquire a new skill. Right. And so our kids are constantly faced with the feeling of inadequacy or the fear of it. Right. Cause we need, we need to feel like there's at least a path forward, a hopeful path forward to become competent or kids just really start shutting down and they really tanks their motivation. So how do you think about that and helping kids, helping scaffold a greater competence in kids? Yeah, I mean, I think it depends on the classroom, right? I don't think, I think that some schools and some classrooms do competency really, really well. Um, I get the pleasure of observing teachers as well as parents, right? And so it's really important to acknowledge that there are great, great examples of kids feeling competency in schools, um, just as there are great, great feelings and examples of kids feeling competency outside of school. So it all depends on the environment that facilitates it. Um, I think, yes, I mean, when you are forced to learn a specific thing, right, it really depends on how you learn it. So... Mm -hmm. The learning process is like, we don't feel competent about things all the time, right. right? When we first learn something, there is a learning curve. And so it goes from, okay, I'm like, am I interested in this skill? Number one, right? So do I, do I have that intrinsic interest? And then how am I learning? Um, am I feeling good about that learning? Or am I feeling sort of like, yeah, maybe this is not for me. And then, you know, sometimes, sometimes you have to get over that hump of this is not for me to really get into the good stuff. So I'll give you an example. When my son started playing guitar, he was like, okay, this is okay, right? Like, it's, it's okay. It's fun. Um, and then his teacher sort of facilitated this whole like jazz improv improvisation thing. And then all of a sudden it was like, poof. Okay. I didn't have to like do the notes on the, the sheet music. 
I can improvise. And this opened up a whole new world for him where he suddenly got interested, 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 and it became a huge interest, something like he got his master's in music theory. So it became a huge interest and something that he actually assessed himself on and had others assess him on. So we do have to think about the learning cycle in terms of competence. And we also have to think about, you know, some kids take a while to really like get good at stuff. We all take a while to get good at stuff and to Mm -hmm. honor that process, right? It's not just like, I hate math. It's, you know, sort of like, okay, like, how are you feeling about math? How can we raise the competence level? But also like, is, is it a certain thing that's blocking us or is it, you know, something that we can get through? How much do you think that is subconscious? Do you think like a child is like, oh, I really like this or it just is more natural, like with this learning curve you're talking about? Yeah, I mean, I I don't know, right? Like we, there's not enough research on it, but I can tell you by watching, and it also depends on their past learning history, but I can tell you by watching kids that some kids feel really comfortable, even if they're stuck on something, to get through that stuckness and to get on the other side. And some kids have this like pattern of maybe learned helplessness or like, I definitely can't do math. And so I, I really can't get to the other side. And that's totally fine, too. It's just a matter of, you know, again, strengthening this competency level. Like if a kid is not loving math, if a kid has a feeling of learned helplessness, really just examining that and really just thinking about like, do you like, what is it? Is it the numbers? Does it feel like a new language? Right. And and you're really good at it. Right. I see you like grasp this. So, so what's going to get you to the other side where this becomes fun. And again, it shouldn't be a forced process. It should be like a totally, you know, facilitated gentle process, but it's still interesting to see. I love that. Can you tell us a little bit more about what learned helplessness is? That might be a new term for some of our listeners. Yeah, sure. So learned helplessness is just when sometimes we see something, right? We see someone doing something and we immediately go to the part of our brain that says we can't do this, mm-hmm. right? So we do it as adults and kids do it too. Sometimes kids will see like like a paper with lots of text on it and be like, you know what? I really can't read that. Or they'll see like a lot of math problems. They'll be like, yeah, sorry. Like this is not for me. And so without even like looking at it or really examining it, they're just like, I know I can't do this. And so I'm going to put this to the side, pre-decided that I'm just not going to do it. You think we do that just based on our experiences with that, that area of learning? Like what causes that? Sure. Absolutely. Like a lot of times, right? Learned helplessness is learned. It is not like our bodies or minds saying like, I am helpless. It is a learned thing. So um, if I have bad feelings about the piano as an adult, I'm not, I'm not going to like see a piano and look at it with like, let me go play this right now. I'm going to be like, oh my gosh, I was tortured with all those lessons. And now like, I'm like, nope, not for me. So funny that you mentioned that because when I was forced to do piano lessons, bless my mother's heart, I revolted by carving, I hate piano in my grandfather's antique piano. And I didn't even spell piano right. P-E-A-N-O. That's how I yeah. Oh, Katie, that's amazing. So, uh, yeah. I okay. get that. I, mean, I had, you know, again, like I had great parents who gave me like 14 years of piano lessons and I hated every minute. And I do not look at a piano today um, without like thinking about those times. Yeah. So I get that. I do get that. Oh. Okay, so I love that. So we've done competence and learned helplessness. And let's move on to, should we do connection or relatedness? Yeah, we'll do autonomy first because I think it goes into something, right? Like, so autonomy is feelings of freedom and choice about an environment. Um, And so, you know, there are levels of autonomy. So in traditional public schools or even private schools, there might not be a ton of autonomy and choice within a classroom environment, unless a teacher is really, really great at um, giving free time, doing stuff like choice boards, giving choice assignments, choice readings. There are ways to facilitate autonomy and freedom of choice in a classroom. But the homeschooling and unschooling environment also provides a ton of ways to facilitate freedom and choice. And of course, when you're thinking about homeschooling and unschooling, it is unschooling that provides unlimited 
limited choice to kids, right? Yeah. Kids get to decide what they do all day. They get to create a schedule or a list of activities they want to do for themselves. And so, you know, an environment of choice does increase intrinsic motivation because you're doing what you love and what you're passionate mm -hmm. about all day long. So how do you respond to parents or teachers who say, well, it's important that adult, an adult decides what they learn? Like, how do you think about that? Because I think for our listeners who are public school teachers or administrators, in any way participating in education where there is a curriculum schedule and there are standards involved, like, how do you cope with that? How do you put those things together with autonomy and still help create that environment? I mean, I think there's different ways to provide choice for kids in classrooms. So for our teachers and our admin listening, right, this is where differentiation comes in. This is where choice assignments come in. This is where like a free period where you give students a free period to really explore and do what they want comes in. So what I'm hearing you say is that in the homeschooling or unschool, I mean, you can you can homeschool from a very adult directed place and you could have a lot of autonomy in a teacher led classroom. Like it really, you can still have autonomy. Is that what you're saying? Am I hearing you right? Sure. I mean, you, you know, again, like when we talk about cognitive evaluation theory, it's just providing an environment that facilitates, right? Competence, autonomy, and relatedness. Okay. It doesn't define what that environment is. Um, I write a ton about self-determination theory and cognitive evaluation theory and homeschooling and unschooling, but that is not the only learning environment that can provide choice and autonomy, right? Um, right. But of course, when you're looking from a spectrum, right, there's your public schools with a set curriculum that are going to probably naturally have the least choice. And then you have unschooling on the other end of the spectrum, where you're going to have the most choice, the most freedom, the most autonomy. Okay, got it. So would you say that for any given child or family, like always giving the most autonomy is always the right decision? Or would you say there are some families and some kids who would actually benefit from a more structured environment? You'll notice I am never a right decision type of person, <laughs> right? There is all this research and there's all this learning. I am always of the philosophy that you choose and your child or teen chooses the learning environment that is right for them. And for each particular family, that might be different. Mm -hmm. um, and for each particular family, right? Like a lot of choice might sound great and work with their lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And that's wonderful. And for some families, you know, there's just not the ability to give so much choice. So they're working within the systems that they have in place. And that's totally fine too. So the right choice is the one that you're comfortable with. But if you're thinking about intrinsic motivation and facilitating intrinsic motivation within your kids, then you do want to think about um, providing autonomy and choice, even if it's just on the weekends, right? If you're a parent that doesn't right. homeschool or unschool, mm -hmm. thinking about how you can provide autonomy and choice on a Saturday morning, or thinking about how you can provide autonomy and choice, like on a Sunday where everyone does their own thing. So, you know, it's never a bad thing to integrate that type of autonomy and choice, no matter what environment. So the next one is relatedness. And I think everyone sees this as very easy, right? You you love your child, you accept your child, and therefore the child is going to see you as that one person who unconditionally accepts them no matter what. And I think that this is actually just like unconditional love, the hardest one, right? It is so easy to love your child when they are you know, academically successful and when they are polite and amazing and wonderful. And sometimes it's harder to love your child when they are maybe behaving in a way that you would prefer them not to behave in or when they love bowling and not so much math or when they, right, like when they are doing their schoolwork um, and, you know, not playing video games. So, you know, that relatedness is you love and accept the child no matter what, no matter whether they are playing 
24 hours worth of video games, you know, or 18 hours. Um, and, and that's the hard part. You know, DC and Ryan will talk about the concept of autonomy support, which is part of relatedness. And it's supporting kids' uh, freedom of choice. And we all know as parents, we know as teachers, that that is sometimes harder, right? Um, it's, it's easy when something is set up and we can guide a child or teen toward that thing. It's way harder when we're saying, hey, you have unlimited choice and here I am, I'm going to have your back no matter what, even if it's a choice I wouldn't make myself. Mm. Yeah. Adrian, I'm curious how you've seen that play out with your kids. Yeah. So as you're talking, I struggle a little bit because the video game thing, for example. So I have a kiddo who is differently wired. He's neurodivergent. And I see that the video games, yes, he would like to do that all day long, but physiologically it affects him. His eyes become bloodshot. His face gets a rash on it. I could see we actually got a pulse oximeter per his recommendation or per the psychologist's recommendation. His heart rate goes through the roof and then he becomes very ragey and angry. So I struggle with this of how much autonomy do I give him in that when it's clearly it seems like it's not the safest choice for his body and brain? Are you able to expound upon that a little bit? I mean, I'm not ever the person to give parenting advice, right? As you can probably tell. But I'm also, I also work with kids with disabilities all the time. I work with neurodivergent kids all the time, right? And so a lot of times it's having that conversation. And I'm sure you've had this as a parent. Right. Like, do you see that like pulse oximeter? Like, do you see your yeah. pulse go up? Can you observe it? Do you feel like how do you feel when you're playing those video games? Can you identify how you feel? And then having it be a conversation instead of like a judgment call or a like you can't do that. Or right. phrases like, I hate video games, though. No. <laughs> I've right, never said right, that right. <laughs> <laughs> accidentally, maybe. Um, but yeah, I agree. I We do have lots of conversations and I do try to turn it inward so that then he can have autonomy and choice within the boundaries and within the limits that are good for his body and brain, which seem to work. So then he still feels like he has choice. And we are on the cusp of moving to unschooling. We went from very traditional school to micro schooling to homeschooling with a tutor. She's here right now with him. And now we're right on that cusp, but I think he just needs to have full choice and free reign of what he does. But I struggle a little bit. I love like, hearing you because I'm like, okay, but what about that paradigm shift of is it okay? Because there's still something back here going, well, I don't know. Is is that really okay? Or is it right or wrong? Um, and not that there is a right or wrong answer, but yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of paradigm shifting that needs to happen to meet kids where they are, to give them all of these things that you're talking about. Yeah, it's hard. You know, it's super hard. It, it becomes harder as your child ages too, right? And becomes an adolescent. Um there is a term in the literature, which I really appreciate and love, and it's actually not in, it's more in disability literature than it is in uh, self-determination literature, but it's called dignity of risk. Mm -hmm. And so when you are giving your child or teen autonomy, right? So a lot of choice, a lot of freedom, there's also this sort of dignity of risk where not every decision your child or teen makes for themselves is going to be a, the right one. And we never want to see our kids fail. We never want our, to see our kids get hurt or be unsafe in any sort of way. But when we're giving freedom and autonomy, there is that risk. And so we kind of have to, as kids get older, acknowledge that they are going to make their own choices and they're going to make mistakes because who among us have not. And we're going to, as autonomy supportive people and parents and teachers, see that, allow them to make the mistake and then 
fully accepted. I mean, this is like, these are like hard stats, right? Like fully yeah. accepted and then talk about it so that there's learnings out of it. Um, it's super hard. Like dignity of risk is not easy. It's hard to watch individuals that you love make not wonderful decisions, but it's also part of the process of autonomy and freedom. And it's a scary part, but it's also yeah. an important part. I think maybe one of the reasons it's so scary, at least if I put my parent hat on, it's because I feel like responsible for the results and actions of my kids and that they reflect on me as a parent. So if I'm letting my, giving my kids lots of autonomy and not controlling them, they're going to make bad, bad, bad decisions. They're going to make mistakes. And then I feel judged as a parent. Right. And I think we all do. We have this kind of societal burden of like parental peer pressure or something um, to make sure our kids are staying on track and staying online, like just doing the things that they're supposed to be doing, that they're quote unquote good kids. And it's hard to let that judgment go. What, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, we just have to let go of being judged as parents, right? None of us are going to be perfect parents. Um, as long as we have our, our kids ultimate health and safety in mind, right? Like, you know, within limits, we also have to create spaces of freedom um, for our kids when we can and as comfortable as we feel, right? All of us parent differently. There's not one right way to parent. And so you kind of have to let go of that judgment, but it's so hard. I mean, we know from literature um, that one of the hardest things when people choose unschooling is the sense of criticism that they get um, from those very close to them, whether it be, you know, a partner or a family member or a friend. We know that that's the hardest, that's the biggest challenge everyone reports about unschooling is that sense of criticism. And we feel that all the time, right? And, 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 I felt it as a unschooling parent. I write about it all the time. I felt intensely criticized. I felt intensely judged about my parenting choices. I mean, the nice thing is I'm on the other side. And so I could let go of that criticism and judgment. But I would be lying to you if I said I didn't wake up scared every day. I woke up scared and feeling judged almost every day of that experience. Do you think teachers that provide more autonomy also feel that judgment? Because I'm imagining being a classroom teacher, you know, you're judged by your kids hitting those standards, their test scores. And if you're providing more autonomy, those things might go down. Oh, yeah. I mean, you can imagine, right? Like a school, um, you're a teacher, you provide a lot of autonomy and choice, you're being observed by your administrator, it's a different type of classroom, right? So there's going to be a lot of questions. And so, um, you know, there are ways to ease people into a more choice filled autonomous environment. Um, but yeah, I mean, you're going to feel judged. The more choice and autonomy you give your kids and teens, the more judged you are going to feel. And I don't know if there's any way around that. What I'm hearing you say too, this, I think it's really important that we talk about the relatedness part, because it's not like we just let them fail and just watch them fail. We're there to support them through it and give them options and help them look inside instead of just telling them what to do. Is that correct? That's it. I mean, it's not like we're watching the dignity of risk is not watching someone fail and be like, well, they failed. And so I'm not going to do anything. Right. It's sort of like having that conversation. Are you OK? How are you feeling about it? Here's how I'm feeling about it. Right. Like what are what are similarities about how we're both feeling about this? What did you learn from this? Parenting, teaching, they're all really super hard things, right? And I think the intrinsic motivation is amazing and it's wonderful. Um, but again, the more freedom, autonomy, and choice you are going to provide, we don't live in a free, autonomous, choice-filled society, right? We, we live in a society where there are lots of boundaries and where there are lots of extrinsic motivators. We are doing something different. And so you are going to get criticism from the choice, most likely. Um, and, that's, and that's okay, as long as it feels authentic and safe in your heart. Right. I am I am very much into individuals creating choices um, based on what what feels right in their family structure, what feels right in their heart, what feels right for their kids. 
Right. Attuning to what our kids need. Because I have seen as my paradigm has shifted from this, no, you do as I say, I don't know that I was ever fully <laughs> like yeah. that, but I'm sure there was some of that, right? It's residual <laughs> from, from my own childhood. But as I've shifted, I see that this is the right choice, not just because of what I feel in my heart, but I can attune to see how much happier and how he can actually access joy. Now, because he is married to Virgin, he struggles with the feeling words and really understanding and, and social context. But as he gets older, we're seeing more and more growth in those areas because he's getting the freedom to be able to be himself, which is huge. Yeah. I love that you mentioned like joy and belonging right? Because like joy and happiness are what we're striving for here, I hope, as as parents. And whatever makes our kids feel most joyful, most happy is probably what we should be doing. I love that as a guy. Although I can just hear like the, the, the pushback to this is, well, kids have to learn math and they're not going to love it every minute, right? Yeah. So like, what do you say to that? Yeah, I, kids have to learn math and they're not going to love it every minute. Um, you know, it's... <laughs> it's um there's so many layers to this and i think the first layer is the why why do kids have to learn math what are the goals of math like why do kids have to learn about numbers is right. there a reason if there's no reason for your child to learn about numbers then you don't have to worry about it right um but if there are reasons then that guides the learning. I will say we, I was very, very probably into basic math. I feel like basic math skills were important. I felt like it was important for my son to be able to go to, into a grocery store with $20 and be able to make some meals out of that, um, which is so funny because now it's a TikTok challenge. But like when we were doing it, like I'd be like, here's $10 because it's all we can afford. You know, like go into that grocery store and see what we can do. It's a real life challenge. Yeah, <laughs> just like, online. Social media challenge. Like my son laughs. He says, "Yeah, <laughs> yeah." Um, so you know, we did a lot of math that was purposeful, right? Like the budgeting math, the the math to go to the grocery store. We didn't do a ton of higher level math when we were unschooling, and everyone's like, "Well, weren't you afraid? And weren't you fearful?" Um, he got his bachelor's in music and guitar performance, and he didn't do a lot of math. He wanted to go to graduate school, and he had to take his GREs, and GREs contain math. And so, my goodness, right? Like, he got a book, and he learned math. I mean, that's what unschooled kids do, right? Like unschooled kids know how to learn. It's not like I, I raised a super genius kid. He's an amazing human being. He's 27 years old. He's an editor at a really large publishing company. He's incredible. He's a music educator. Um, but it's really not like, like he learned like everyone else. He went to Khan Academy. He reviewed what he learned. He knew the basics he learned from there. He passed his GREs. He did great. He got into graduate school. So for me, learning is all about purpose and generalization. And so if you can provide a purpose or if the ch even better, if the student themselves, the child or teen can provide a purpose to their learning, everything gets better. Like, here's why I learned math. Here's why I need to. Um, I that. think that purpose part is so important. I love that. Yeah, we do a lot of that at Prenda. And one of our guides, she always talks about her son who's in her micro school. And whenever he gets frustrated with not wanting to do math, she always points to what his purpose is. She said, what's, what's your goal? He wants to be a, a scientist on the Mars rover. I can't exactly remember exactly what he wants to do. She's like, well, that requires math. And then he's like, okay, I need to do this math lesson because that's what I want to do when I grow up. And we're really trying to connect to their purpose, which is just huge. And it, it's linked to that feeling of joy and that feeling of being competent <laughs> and what the whole goal of this is. Yeah. I mean, I'd argue that, you know, teaching as a whole, like that's an important part, whether whatever um, educational choice you create, like the purpose of something is really important, whether it's a class, whether it's a course, whether it's a, a subject, like why are we doing this? The why behind it. 
What kind of high-level school system reform do you see as necessary or beneficial to providing students with learning experiences that support these needs? Gosh, it's such a great question and something that I've been working toward my entire life, right? Um, I tell my teachers that I study unschooling and homeschooling because I feel like both environments can learn from one another. So there's a lot that public and private schools can learn from a homeschooling or unschooling environment, a more intrinsically motivated environment. And there is a ton that unschoolers and homeschoolers can learn about traditional teaching environments as well. Um, and so when I look at it from that perspective, of course, I'd love to see like more intrinsic motivation in schools. I'd really love us to reform schools from the ground up, right? Like I think a lot of times we are just so involved in the busyness. Like I know what it takes to run a school. I know what it takes to run a district. I know what it takes at the local level, at the state level, right? Um, and so it's really, really important for us to really go down um, at, our, at our core level to know as people and as parents and as teachers and administrators what we believe in, what the values are, and also to really see intrinsic motivation and kids' intrinsic motivation as key. The more we talk about social-emotional learning, whether in a school environment or in a parenting environment, the more intrinsic motivation comes into play, right? Like our goal is happy, joyful, loving kids that turn into like happy, joyful, well-adjusted adults that are doing what they love. And if that's the real goal, then we really do need to lean on and focus on intrinsic motivation and self-determination theory and those competence, autonomy, and relatedness tenets um, to really reform schools. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing. All right. Our last question we ask all of our guests this, who is someone in your life that has kindled your love of learning, your curiosity, your motivation? Oh, I love this question. It's going to make me cry. Um, my son, the biggest joy in my life was being able to watch him uh, grow and be curious and learn. Um, and I got the honor of being able to do that. Like his first day of school was the first day of college. So I got the joy of being able to do that for most of his life. And it wasn't that I was a stay at home mother either. I was a working mother who was single. And so he did a lot of stuff with me. He would go to college classes with me. He would do a lot of stuff for me so we could like live this life. But I will say probably the best experience of my life um, was to be able to watch him learn um, and to be able to watch him grow and to be able to watch him become an adult. It really just has given ultimate purpose to my life, um, to my life as an educator, to my life um, as a teacher to my students. So it was absolutely definitely just watching my my own child learn and grow in this very free way, full of autonomy and choice. You were really able to kindle this incredible relationship with him because you're allowing him to be who he is. That is so beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, it's super important, right, to allow kids to be able to do to be who they are. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Dr. Gina Riley. Thanks for stopping by Kindled and sharing everything with us. We so enjoyed this chat. Thank you. Such a joy. That was so amazing. I'm so grateful that Dr. Riley took all of that time with us. And something that I'm walking away with, just circling back to my to this story about my son's handwriting, is that I just have a greater sense of awareness of like how much stress I'm bringing to that situation that really is probably unnecessary. And letting go of a lot of that judgment, like we talked about, is probably, I don't know if it's the best thing for his handwriting, but it's the best thing for my like internal well-being and, and probably for our relationship, which is really what parenting and educating is all about. It's about relationship and maintaining influence and connection, not always just about those like hard and fast skills like handwriting. Yeah. What I got from it is just keeping that open communication. So it doesn't mean that, oh, he's not going to ever be good at handwriting, right. but also, hey, I can talk to him about it in a loving, supportive way and then put the ball in his court. Absolutely. So Adrian, where can people find more of Dr. Riley's work? 
You can find her at GinaRileyPhD.com, and you can also find her books on Amazon and Barnes & Noble. Remember, her books are Unschooling, Exploring Learning Beyond the Classroom, The Homeschooling Starter Guide, and most recently, Joys of Self-Determined Learning with Carlo Ricci. Links are in the show notes. Don't forget to subscribe to Kindled wherever you get your podcasts. Leave us a review, rate us, share your favorite episode on social media, and don't forget to tag us at Prenda Learn. For more Kindled content, head on over to Prenda.com backslash Kindled and subscribe to the Kindled newsletter. But don't forget that you can also nominate someone that is doing an awesome job kindling curiosity, motivation, or love of learning in the lives of young people in their life to become a member of the Spark Squad, which is a very fun exclusive club for people who are amazing at kindling all these things. And they will be featured on our social media and in our newsletter as a little thank you and good job. So you can email those nominations to podcast.prenda.com. Thank you so much for listening today. And remember, please keep on kindling.